Welcome to the season finale of The Claws Corner. We will be back in January with brand new episodes. I would like to take this time to thank my family, friends, and you, the viewer, for tuning in every week and making this show a success. A special thank you goes out to John Bristol of Elmwood Productions for all of his time and dedication that he puts into each show to ensure that the graphics, pictures, and video sync perfectly with my interview. It brings the show to the next level, and I am very grateful for his work. This pandemic, without a doubt, has changed the way people communicate. The only bright spot is that it introduced me to Zoom, which was the genesis for my YouTube channel. I would like to thank everyone for all the kind words regarding my show, and I promise that season two will be even bigger and better. This past year felt like being in an episode of The Twilight Zone, which is a perfect segue for my season finale. Please welcome Ann Serling, daughter of Rod Serling, creator of The Twilight Zone, and Mark Dwiziak, author of Everything I Need to Know I Learned in The Twilight Zone. The Claws Corner would like to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. See you in January for the premiere of Season 2. Welcome to another episode of The Claws Corner of the Zoom Edition. Today's episode features not one, but two fascinating guests. My first guest earned her degree in elementary education with a minor in English. She substitute taught, worked at a school for children with special needs, and then was a preschool teacher at Cornell University's Early Childhood Program and Cooperative Nursery School. She loved writing and began writing poetry, and this led to being published in the anthology, The Twilight Zone, The Original Stories. On April 29th, 2014, she released her beautifully and eloquently written memoir, As I Knew Him, My Dad, Rod Serling, which is all about growing up with her dad, American screenwriter, playwright, television producer, narrator and creator of one of the best and most popular TV shows of all time, The Twilight Zone. I am, of course, referring to the great Rod Serling. My second guest is a theater, film, and television critic, actor, director, author, and Mark Twain aficionado, Mark Dwidziak. His books include The Shape of the River, The Bedside, Bathtub, and Armchair Companion to Dracula, The Shawshank Redemption Revealed, How One Story Keeps Hope Alive, The Columbo File, a case study, Night Stalking, a 20th anniversary Kolchak Companion, and my personal favorite, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone. They join me to talk about their lives, as well as the life and legacy of not one, only one of the greatest writers of our lifetime, but also one of the most important, Rod Serling. Rod not only entertained us for over 60 years, but also taught us that by unlocking the door to imagination, anything is possible. Please welcome Ann Serling and Mark Dwidziak to the Claws Corner. Thank you. How are you? Good, how are you? Thank you. I am for doing that. very well. I'm so happy to have you both on the show. I am a huge fan of Twilight Zone, grew up watching that, pretty much know every episode by heart, and it's so great to have you both on the show. So Anne, I want to start with you, because as I mentioned, in 2014, you wrote your book, As I Knew Him, My Dad, Rod Serling. So what made you decide to write a biography on your dad? Well, after my dad died, I was um, for many, many years really paralyzed with grief. And I tried to write a book a few years after he died, um, called In His Absence, and I hadn't even begun to deal with this whole grief process. So then it was something that was in the works in my head, because I find writing cathartic, as my father did. So um, it took me several years, but I finally did it. And, and initially it was um, just as a, t you know, again, to navigate the grief and I also wanted to know more about my dad's professional side. And, I, and thirdly, I wanted to set the record straight because I knew my father, some had said he was this dark, tortured soul. And that was the polar opposite of the dad I knew or, or the friend that many, many knew. So. You mentioned, I heard you mention this in other interviews, that uh, the hardest part of writing this book was dealing with your grief. And it was your editor that told you that your grief is so central to this book and encouraged you to be more open. Right, exactly. And when she said that, the floodgates opened. Like, and it was I'm not... probably the best advice I really got because I, I knew I was holding myself back because I'm, a, I'm sort of a private person and I didn't want to you know, I had to measure what I wanted to say. And, but when she said that, I got it. It, it just, I got it. Yeah, there's also that, and then you did a talk somewhere, and that's when you realized how many people were helped and comforted by hearing you speak and reading your words. Yeah, it's really stunning. The people that I've heard from um, who, who connect to the grief, but also people that I've heard from 
who tell me they became a writer because of my father or, and, and many who said they had tortured childhoods and thought of my father as their own father. And I was so touched by that as my dad would have been too. Well, speak, Mark, uh, I read your book, like I told you, I loved it. And there's one example to what Anne was talking about. It's from American television producer, Brandon Braga. He states in the book that the episode Long Distance Call starring Billy Moomy helped him comfort him help comfort him about his own issues of loss and grief after his grandmother died. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, and, and Brandon is an interesting guy because I, I've known him since he was kind of a baby writer on uh, uh, Star Trek, the next generation. And uh, he's from uh, not far from where I live now. He's, he was, he's from Canton, Ohio. And uh, Brandon was uh, his favorite show growing up was the twilight zone. And he always thought that when he got into writing for television, he'd end up writing on a show like The Twilight Zone. And um, I guess you could say he, he got it in a way, although his tastes run more towards Stephen King and let's say the spookier side of The Twilight Zone, he ended up working up on a show uh, with a, an, an iteration of Star Trek. And Star Trek really comes about because Rod Serling shows how to use allegorical storytelling uh, on television. Uh, that's what the Twilight Zone was. And Gene Roddenberry learned from Rod Serling. He, he said that. I mean, he's just, that's, that's not supposition. That's not guesswork. That's flat out what, what, what Gene Roddenberry said was, you know, the Twilight Zone goes off the air in 1964. Star Trek starts in 1966. And it almost, it's almost like the passing of the baton. And that they're both doing the same thing, which is if you put it in the guise of fantasy or science fiction or horror or whatever you want to uh, call the genre that they're working in at the time, you can write about anything. You can write about anything and the censors won't care and the, uh, the, the network uh, standards and practices people won't care and the, uh, the sponsors won't care. And you can, you can write about and say, you can write about prejudice. You can write about war. You can write about bigotry. And uh, they both took the same gamble, but, Rod sort of sewed the way. So when Brandon ended sons up on Star Trek Next Generation, he is working in the same tradition as, uh, as the Twilight Zone. Well, you're, you brought up a great point. I was watching the uh, infamous interview with Rod Serling and uh, Mike Wallace. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned that a lot in my yeah, talks. Yeah. Yeah. But what I, what I was most interested in was when he was talking about what you just said, all the censorship <laughs> that he was going through. And yeah. one of the things that he went through was, you know, well, was um, I think it was Requiem for Heavyweight, where there was a line that said, got a match, and Ronson Lighters was one of the sponsors. They had to delete that line. So that's, when he went through that, all these different things um, with the sponsors, he finally said, you know what, I'm going to create my own show, and an alien could say things that a Republican or Democrat couldn't. And Well, that, that's kind of a minor example of what he went through. Anne could talk about this, but I think the I think the one that almost must have really opened his eyes to realize there's got to be a better way was uh, A Town Is Turned to Dust. Wouldn't you say, Anne, that that was probably the experience with that script right. that, that really put him... Right. Go ahead, Anne, you, you, you know more about this than I do. Well, I, I don't know about that. You are an expert. But yes, um, it went through many, many revisions. And finally, my dad said, um, it was called The Town Is Turned to Dust, and his final statement was his script had turned to dust. So, yeah, but the censorship was torturous. Well, and, and that script in particular, you, you know, uh, what was he writing about? What, was, what, 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 did he, what did he want to write about in A Town Is Turned to Dust? Right, Emmett, the whole Emmett Till story, right. Right. And, and, and they kept forcing changes yeah. and revisions. And they just so, he had a very powerful message he wanted to get across. And by the end, it had been so badly compromised yeah. that yeah. he just thought there's, there's got to be another way. I mean, this is really the route into the Twilight Zone. A lot of people who have written about Rod Serling uh, tend to look at little examples and clues from his earlier work and say, well, he did a script for Kraft. And it sort of was like what he's later going to do with the Twilight Zone. He did a script in Cincinnati, which is like this. And he, that just basically tells us that he always kind of had an interest in fantasy, which is yeah. true. And so we know, so we know that that's, that's true. But really, I think this is the moment when the door to the Twilight Zone starts to open. 
was mm -hmm. when you know because and and I and I I I've, I've made this point before, but you know Rod Serling sort of comes into his own as a writer just as television is coming into its own as a medium. They sort of grow up together, uh, yeah. and and when television starts in the late 1940s and the early 1950s. There's no other way to say it. It really is the Wild West. It, because they're making it all up. They, they're making up a, a whole new world. There are no rules. They're creating the rules as they go along. And, you know, the possibilities were limitless when you start. So it's a very exciting medium to be involved in at this point. You're there at the beginning. You're there at the inception. And I think, you know, that that matched Rod being at the beginning of his career as a writer and learning what he could do. And it was just this kind of great marriage of the being in the right place at the right time uh, mm -hmm. for this. And you see him, you know, rapidly maturing as, as a writer and an artist during this period. But when you get to the end of the 50s, when you, when you start to, to reach the, the, the close of the decade, then television has almost become what Mark Twain would say was civilized. It, uh, which is always a bad thing uh, for individuals and societies. Too much civilization is a bad thing. And in this case, television became nothing but rules. And yeah. when you start in the, in the early 50s, it's do whatever you want. Go ahead, swing for the fences. By the end of the 50s, now you can't say that, you know, because the stations in the South will get upset if you say that. Mm -hmm. You you can't do you can't write it that that way because the sponsor will get upset, yeah. and so now it's just nothing but rules, and you know it's it's and it's getting tighter and tighter and tighter, you know, and your dad must have felt like he was in a straitjacket, which was getting increasingly tighter as right. the fifties went along. Right. When, well, when he did that, my Wallace interview, <clears throat> Twilight Zone was about to launch, and he was very very wary. Um, so I think Mike Wallace posed the question, so you're not gonna write anything serious anymore. Yeah, I was gonna get into that. Yeah. Yeah. But I love his answer because he was so passionate about what he was doing and he believed in himself. But he was also very modest and self-deprecating too. I love that about him as well. Mm -hmm. And funny, very yes. funny. Well, I wanna talk about some of the stories in your book, but uh, we were talking about, you, you mentioned television in the very beginning. I was reading somewhere, he wasn't a fan of filmed television, which was starting at that time. He, he preferred live television, is that correct? Yes. What was the reason for that? Um, I don't know that I have an answer for that. Um, but I know he missed it, um, laterally. Do you know, know I don't, but I could take a guess. Um, my guess, guess would be, it had to have been like pure adrenaline to have been doing live television back then. You know, if you look at those, uh, the live, and, and, and you know, the first off, we always call this the golden age of television. It wasn't. I mean, there was a lot of junk. There's always been a lot of junk on television. There was a lot of junk on television. There, there, there was a lot of roller derby on TV during that era. There was a lot of wrestling on TV. There was a lot of really just, just inane game shows on TV everybody sort of, I think, thinks that the 1950s, it was all Rod Serling and Patty Shayefsky. Uh, you know, what they were doing essentially was showing the possibilities of what the medium could be. Uh, they were the high end of it. So what was gold in the golden age was, was pure gold. It, it, it really did gleam, but it, it's kind of a mistake to sort of identify that era just by what we remember, the, the best things that we remember. But when the live dramas were at their best, it really wasn't film. It was more akin to theater because they were doing it live and they were doing it with limitations. And that's what you do on the stage. When you do when you work on something on the stage, you are working with a finite space, a finite uh, amount of uh, set pieces and, and such. So it's all about innovation. It's all about how do you create the illusion of what you are doing with limitations. Movies are all about taking the limitations off. With movies, and, and you know, I mean, that's become increasingly true in the era of CGI when you can basically do anything. But television, the early to live television really had one foot in live theater. And there is nothing like the adrenaline rush of that. And for everybody involved, it must have been an incredible kick. 
And to go to film stuff, when you could do a take after take, you could get it right, you could do endless setups. Yeah, the product probably got better. It's slicker from a slicker standpoint, but it probably wasn't as much fun. It probably wasn't anywhere near as much fun. That is a pure guess, you know, and that is just a, a, a writer's supposition. But if I was to guess as to why he, he probably, I was, I'd think he had years and years of that adrenaline rush mm -hmm. of doing, can you imagine what it was like sitting down and, and, and sitting in the booth and sitting on the sidelines the moment they went live on Requiem for a Heavyweight? Yeah. Can you imagine, you talk about like the curtain going up. Yeah. And you add to the fact that they didn't know whether Ed Wynn was going to get through the performance or not. Right. And all of us, and you know, because he, 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 He'd had lousy rehearsals. He had really lousy rehearsals. They actually had an, another actor standing by in case he couldn't do it. Right. And all of a sudden, <laughs> Wynn finds the gear, turns it on. He's magnificent. And it's magic time. Yeah. Well, if they had filmed it, they would have known in advance what they had. Mm -hmm. They would have known in the editing booth what they would have had. And in this, you know, I got to say something. I'm going to compliment you, Rich. I don't believe I've ever been asked this question before. Thank you. you know, it's sometimes odd. Sometimes you hear the same question. That is a really good question. <laughs> and, 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 and you're, you know, and I'm, and I'm making it up as I'm going along here. I'm, you know, but I really think that if I was to zero in on what the best guess would be, that would be the best guess. I think, I think you're absolutely right. And I know there was great trepidation that Edwin would forget his lines and, and um, you're right, it was turned out terrific. And can you imagine what it was like when it was over? Yeah. When, it, when they had done it, not just the relief, but just the euphoria yeah. and the, I mean, you know, I, I'm not much of an actor. Um, you know, I've, 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 I've got about two notes as an actor. You know, my wife is the real actor in the family. But, you know, I've, I've done enough theater to know that when it goes right and, and, you're, and you're at, at the end of a live theater, you're on a buzz like you can't believe it it's better than any drug you can ever imagine and you're, you're 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 sky high and uh it takes a long time to come down off that that's why we you go out after you've done a performance you don't collapse you think oh you, you, you've just given us you know you everything's buzzing everything's going at, a, at an electric buzz mm -hmm. and you've got to do something so you go out and you have a couple of drinks and you have dinner or whatever after at two in the morning because mm -hmm. you uh so I, th I would think, you know, as again, as TV became more civilized, it became less fun. Mm -hmm. you know, well, I can tell you from personal experiences, I've done radio and I've also done stand-up comedy. So I know <laughs> that you get that instant gratification. You know if they love you. And when they do love you, like you said, it's euphoria that there's no way you're going to be coming down for about three or four hours later. Three o'clock in the morning, I'd still be home trying to get to sleep because I was so happy. I had a great show. So yeah, I agree with everything you just said. And I'm guessing from your answer and what you, you know, reading about Rod Serling, that was probably it. Um, he, but going back to, speaking of radio, uh, he was in radio and he had a unique perspective on radio. He said that in terms of drama, radio dug its own grave. It aimed downwards, had become cheap and unbelievable and had willingly settled for second best. Was that, did, was that towards the end of his radio where he was getting into TV? Isn't he, he was just getting bored with that? Well, I know um, he was doing testimonials for a while and was hating it. Huh. So I, I think, and, and I, he talked about this in that Mike Wallace interview. He, so it, it uh, even though at one point he was acting, directing, and writing some of the radio scripts, I think he was ready to move on. Would you agree with that, Mark? I, I would. I, I think he, he's being a little harsh on radio because... Um, this is a period, you know, when everything was in, in flux and radio was fighting for its, its, its life at that time. You know, radio was, 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 was fighting for its place on the, on the spectrum. And I mean, you gotta remember, you know, television is coming along and it's all about new stuff and it's all about positive. And television's a monster. When television comes in, can you imagine what the response from radio was? You know, I, I mean, I can't, I, I, I'm not going to use the language that they probably used, but the language was probably pretty extreme 
when they saw this monster come rolling towards them and they knew, radio knew, this thing is going to take a big old bite out of what we do. Mm -hmm. And you look at everything, everything that was 90% of what was radio. You, could, you got to remember that when, when, when Rod Serling was growing up, radio was the dominant medium. People always think movies were the dominant medium. No, radio was the dominant medium. Radio was in every single household. Everybody had, a, it was in close to 99% of American households in the 1930s and 40s. Everybody listened to radio and, and radio was wonderful because radio, it was all about your imagination. The world could be as big and as opulent and as, and as gauging as you wanted it to be. It was as big as your imagination. And, you know, so here comes television. And at, at just at this, this period. And what does it do? It takes over almost everything that radio has. And it does it better. In a sense, like it does it better because it can show you pictures. So it takes what? It takes the variety show. The variety show used to be on radio. Not anymore. It's on television. The sitcom was created by radio. It's on television now. The soap opera. The soap opera was created by radio. It goes to television. Sports. All of this goes to television. And radio is in a transitional period where it knows it is reduced. It has been greatly reduced by this new medium. So the possibilities are much more limited. What radio did do in that, that standpoint, which was very smart, was it came up with a survival plan, which worked for another 50 years. And the survival plan was all based on, all right, TV's gonna take all of this. We're gonna sit down and figure out what we can still do. What won't they do? What, what, what will they can't do? And what don't they want not to do? So they, music, it was the rise of, 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 of TV formats, radio, which was geared for certain groups, you know, so, so rock stations, country stations, talk uh, and news stations. Um, and they came up with all these formats, which worked. And it, it kept radio going for a long time, but it made it a lot less fun for what a Rod Serling wanted to do. So, and that was all happening in television. So long answer, long answer to your question. You know, which I tend to do. You, you're going well, to have to shut me up. As, no, as I am uh, enjoying this very much. It, but, it's similar to when I was in radio because I was in radio when satellite radio was forming. So people, they were saying the same thing. The terrestrial radio was saying the same thing about satellite radio. Nobody's getting, there was a lot of choice words that they, the program directors that I worked with are using about that too. So it's mm -hmm. just, yep. It's just every time a new medium comes out, the other mediums are afraid they're going to become obsolete. And, uh, and it usually doesn't happen. You know, what happens is the, 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 the surviving medium morphs into something. They adapt, but they don't really die, you yeah. know. And that's basically <clears throat> because it's something I think that, you know, Rod Serling understood innately um, a, as a writer, but just as a human being, is that I think Rod innately understood that human nature doesn't change. If there is a need for something in the human heart and the human mind, it's not going to go away. Unfortunately, that's true of bad things as well as good things. Um, but it, it is, but it, but it's true that nothing ever really dies. You know, I, I always tell my students this at Kent State. It's like you know, I always say, you know, it if if you can try to kill something off here, it's going to jump up over here, and it may take on a different form. It may take on a, a different delivery system, but what it's delivering is going to be the same. It's like when I love when people will say, well, you know, we don't have freak shows anymore. You know, we don't have people setting up tents. We don't have freak shows. It's like, really? Have you watched daytime television lately? <laughs> You're going to tell me that the freak show hasn't gone away? That the taste for the bizarre and to stick your head in the, te in the tent and see the two-headed boy, that thrill is still there. It, now it's morphed and it's gone into different things, but it's still there. You know, we've always had a, a, a need for bread and circuses, you know, and maybe we called it, you know, gladiators in Roman times, and maybe we call it the National Football League today, but we still need that. It's, it's, in, it's deep in the human spirit. It's not going to go away. 
I, it's I going to come up somewhere else. I think you put that beautifully, Mark. That that people don't change, and I and I'm not the first to say this either. But why my dad's writing is still so relevant today, because he dealt with issues that we're still sadly dealing with today. I agree. I mean, I was, I've been watching a lot of the uh, Twilight Zones over again, getting ready for this interview, and I was watching the uh, Monsters Are Doing Maple Street last night, and it's so relevant to everything that's going on right now. Yeah. I mean, that's just one, one example of the 156 episodes that were the Twilight Zone. But yeah, his writing is so relevant. And you made a great point, Mark, in your book, and I tried it out to see if it was accurate. It's very accurate. You said there's only two shows from that time period that people remember. It's I Love Lucy in the Twilight Zone. And mm -hmm. I mentioned Ralph Cramden to a couple of my coworkers. Who's that? I mentioned Rod Schilling. Oh, Twilight Zone. I mentioned you know, Lucy. Oh, I love Lucy. So you, you are correct. Those, I I, think it it gives me no pleasure to be correct. It gives me absolutely no pleasure to watch. You know, I mean, I think I point out in the book um, that we are now moving into the first generation that has not lived in Mayberry. That is not yeah. called Mayberry, its hometown. We are we are now reached the, the first generation that has no recognition for uh, you know Andy and, and Barney and and those people and don't call them neighbors. And uh, it held on a long time. It held the, the Andy Griffith show held on a, a lot longer than it had any right to hold on. But it's joining the honeymooners and and all the rest. Um, that have that have faded into uh, you know that used to be a shared cultural language that we all got the same things growing up in repetition because of reruns and daytime television rerunning these things mm -hmm. so we all did know the Cramptons and we all knew the catchphrases and we all we knew all the you know the characteristics it made these characters um what were called archetypal characters and there are not a, really a lot of archetypal characters um literature gives us them like Ebenezer Scrooge is an archetypal character he's he's, he's a he, he defines a type and he's instantly recognizable because of his personality and his characteristics. But if you really start thinking about literature, most people don't know the characters of literature. They know Ebenezer Scrooge, and that's largely because the pop culture constantly reintroduces it. You know, but television actually gave us more archetypal. Okay, they gave us Archie Bunker. They gave us Ralph Cramden. They gave it, even Fred Flintstone is an archetypal character. Which is based off of the honeymooners. Which is right, yeah. That does you are arguably the same character, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, but you know, um, really, we all knew those same characters to the point that you could say, "Yo, that guy's a real Barney Fife," and you, somebody would know what you were saying. You, somebody would get it. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, fortunately, what the Twilight Zone does is it doesn't give us so much archetypal characters as it gives us these moments and these stories that we all kind of relate to. And that's where the shared language comes from. The shared language comes in the broken glasses. The shared language comes with the gremlin on the wing. Yeah. The, the shared language comes in these stories, which almost are like become Aesop's fables for our generation, for our society, because we all know them. We all know what the, you know, the only thing my book did was add the line that was always at the end of every Aesop's fable, but isn't literally in a Twilight Zone, but it kind of is there hanging in the air if you think about it. And that line is, and the moral of the story is dot, dot, dot. Yeah. You know, because uh, the Twilight Zone was very morality based. You know, no, I and, agree with you. And I'm going to get into your book in a little while. So I just want to go over some other things. But one thing I want to bring up, and I never thought of this until I read it in your book, uh, I love the episode Time Enough at Last starring Bridges Meredith as the bookworm. <laughs> and until you made the comment, you said like the Twilight Zone, and you know this, uh, it's very morality based. That is the one episode where I love the twist ending. And I realized, no, he really did not deserve that. Out of all the Twilight Zone episodes, that's one of the only ones I could think of where, no, he was a great guy. Why he deserved that? And that's funny you brought that up. Right. Mark and I have had this conversation because we both agree with you that it's, he didn't deserve that, right? He was a good guy. And he had all the time in the world at last. No, I felt so bad for him. And it's a great twist ending. But out of all the Twilight Zone episodes, that's the only one I could think of, like you two brought up. So, 
No, he's a great well, guy. And, and I, want, <laughs> I want to be clear about this. Because, first off, that episode is a bit of an outlier because, you know, usually in the Twilight Zone, the people who get it deserve it. The people who, you know, yeah. take it in the shorts uh, have it coming. Uh, and in that one, you, you know, everybody, I like everything else about that episode. I don't want it to make it sound like, because I love Burgess Meredith's performance. Right. I love yeah. the way it's shot. It does have one of the great visuals of all time wrapped around one of the great ironic endings of all time. The, the, but I think one thing that is, 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 is that, Time has not been as good. It's odd that it's called time enough at last because time has not been all that kind to the message of that. Because at the time, reading was not as much in danger as it is today. Now we have a point where, you know, literacy and literature and the, uh, you know, and, and, and people reading and books are all on the danger zone here. Back then, you know, if you listen to the, that episode, you watch that episode, Somebody actually says to, to, to the Burgess Meredith character, you know what your problem is? You're a reader. I go, whoa, hold. <laughs> Stop, Stop the press. <laughs> you know, and, and the notion was that this was a, a form of showing that he was an idler, that he was spending his time yeah. with his nose in a book and that this was an example of, like, that message is not so good. You know, that message is not, is, is we, we want people to do that. We want people to, to have their nose in a book. That would be a good thing you know, to, to have. You know. It is why The Obsolete Man is my favorite Burgess Meredith episode, because the messages are all right. And that's a reader, a man who prizes books, and he's heroic because of it. And he's presented yeah. as a heroic character. So, yeah. I want to get more into the morality of some of the other episodes, and some of my favorites. But before that, I want to talk more about your father, and. I want to go back to uh, the early informative years because I think it's important to revisit because it shows how his early life experiences helped shape his writing. And when he was in college, he joined the debate team, began writing for the school newspaper. And he established himself his reputation as a social activist. So even back then, in early, such an early age, he was very passionate about his beliefs, believed, you know, there should be no hatred, no mob mentality, no prejudice. And it's like, so it starts at a very early age that he had these values instilled in him. Right, and I read, when I was writing my book, I found some article that talked about his mother, who was also very progressive and would write um, op-eds to papers, but I've never been able to put my hands on any. But yeah, my father was very passionate um, about many of these things like prejudice, and it's interesting that his first dose of prejudice came from his own people when he was uh, blackballed, um, by the Jewish fraternity because he was dating uh, non-Jewish girls. Yeah, he was born on Christmas Day and I, your family loved, you know, your grandparents loved Christmas. And what's the, um, how is it worded, Mark? It's a unwrapped Christmas present, something to that effect. I, I, was, the Christ, I was the Christmas present that arrived unwrapped. <laughs> yeah, I so, so I love the fact that, you know, there, I mean, I can't believe he was, he had backlash for doing that. But I mean, I love the fact that they celebrated Christmas. There was, they didn't even think twice about color or race or ethnicity. So that, that was really, and he actually encouraged his fellow students to, to support the war effort. Is that true? Uh, as far as I know, yes. And I just wanted to say, um, I heard the story that when uh, relatives would come to their house, they hid a Christmas tree under the bed. Now, I'm not sure that's true, but that was the story that I heard. Must have been a little tiny Christmas tree. But, yeah. yeah, or yeah. a big bed. <laughs> yeah, he was very vocal from, from a young age. Yeah, well, his own combat experience affected him deeply and influenced much of his writing. Right. A lot of the episodes, I'm not in, my mind went blank on the name of this, but you can help me out with this. The one where, he sees it through, was it a Japanese soldier? Yeah, I think, was that the Purple Testament? Is that no, that, no I, th I think he's thinking about a quality of mercy. Oh, okay. That's the one, yeah. The, the one where it's Dean Stockwell and all of a sudden, yeah. he's, he, he, instead of being an American soldier, he's a Japanese soldier. Yes, and that's the episode I'm thinking of. From the, from the other side. Of the, um, yeah, but, but, but the Purple Testament is a powerful one drawn from his war experience where the, the central character can see the see death in, in the faces of those who are going to die. That sees that eerie glow 
in the face of the people who are going to die. So, you know, there's, you know, when, when, when he, he dipped into the war experiences, um, my, my wife and, and, and daughter and I just rewatched uh, Deaths Had Revisited mm -hmm. uh, a couple of days ago. And Lord, that's a powerful episode. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, that, 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 that delivers just as big a punch today as it did when it was first aired. Yes. And it's one of the few episodes that, that most of them end with the word, the, the Twilight Zone, and this one ended, and I can't remember exactly how it goes, but... It, it, and but, it ends with, the, with the, 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 the notion that all of the, the, the prisoner war camps must remain standing, right. you know, and uh, I, I, you're right, and I can't remember exactly how, but it's the one about how uh, we become the grave diggers when we start to tear down the... Right. the walls it's it's a, again it's just it's just a great episode it is just a powerful episode and it really speaks to the the war and the, the effect that the war had yeah. uh on, i mean you know, right down to the point and i you know is this he's not going to become a writer probably if it's not for the war well he yeah he wanted to be a physical education teacher and he was going to antioch because his brother went there and he was so tortured um, with PTSD, which of course wasn't even a word back then. It was shell shock, I guess. But um, he changed his major from language and literature, or from phys ed to language and literature, because as he said, I needed to write, I needed to get it out of my gut, I needed to get it off my chest. So, and I, and I remember him having nightmares and I would ask him in the morning what happened and he would tell me he had dreamt the enemy was coming at him. So it was constantly in his life. He, um, he enlisted in the war the day after he graduated from high school, and he really wanted to go to Germany because he wanted to fight the Nazis. But of course, he was in the Pacific. You know, and, and I, you, you always kind of look at the clues when you look at how somebody becomes a writer or why somebody, and it's, it's, it's always goes down something that's very, very deep in their, um, their personality. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one thing about, you know, Rod Serling's personality, which I think was, 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 you know, he, he said that, you know, uh, that prejudice was the great, you know, uh, Evil. the great curse, the great sin of our time. But if you extend that out and you sort of look at um, all of the things that he was sort of passionate about, it, it, it really comes down to the defense of those who are in a, put in a weaker position by society, whether through prejudice or through other things. A lot of his writing deals with how we treat the elderly. A lot of his writing, uh, how we treat children. And it's always kind of the weaker p the people who are who have been put in these positions. I almost think you know that, you know, if your dad had lived at a different time, you know, he would have gone off and tried to become join the Round Table as a knight of uh, one of Arthur's knights, to to fight for the. Just as he goes off and talks himself, they would have looked at him and said, "Well, you're too short to be a knight. You're too, you know, look at you." And he would have talked his way into it. He would have talked his way in to, you know, to be, you know, Sir Rodman of the round table and would have gone off to, to, to fight for people who needed a champion, who needed somebody who, to, to fight for the people who, who, who didn't have a voice and, and were weaker. And, you know, I think that's where a lot of that comes from. There is a nobility about uh, Rod Serling. And that's the part of his character. And he finds an outlet for that in his writing. But that comes first. You have to look at that first. That's one of the things I think that leads him. And he finds that writing is not only cathartic for him, but it's almost like a weapon. It's almost like a knight wields a sword. He wields the words. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he creates this, you know, this, this way of making people look and saying, this is how we treat people. This isn't right. It's not right to cast off people at the end of their lives because you've used them all up and now you're going to toss them aside. So, you know, I, again, I think there's, there's just something about Rod Serling's writing. I say this in the book. I, I, I'm not sure that I, I explained it as well as I should, or maybe as well as I just explained it right now. But there is something heroic 
about about that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's overstating the case to call it heroic. No, I don't. I I agree with you. And I, w I wanted to mention this because it goes even back back before the Twilight Zone and Kraft Television Theater. He had an episode called Old McDonald Had a Curve back in 1953. So that was a big issue with him, the age youth problem. It's in patterns. It's yes. in patterns with the Ed Bakley character who is, you yeah. know, basically being forced out because they've used him up and he's, he's now at the end of his career. And he's being bullied and he's being, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's right there. And, you know, his, in, in the script that sort of makes his reputation, yeah. it's, it's right there. And I think that that's a, um, you know, there's a challenge to people in that. There's a challenge to that lead character in Patterns. And there's a challenge to, in, to all of us of, you know, how, how, how are you going to treat people? How, what, what are you going to do when your moment comes? It's so kind of, It's kind of fascinating, too, that he was so cognizant of that at such an early age. I mean, he was, what, 30 when he wrote Patterns? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yep. And, that, I mean, that is a, uh, like, I, and I always say this, because, you know, I, I think people... Because, and, and obviously, I'm second to none in my, in my love and devotion and admiration for The Twilight Zone. But I think, you know, you can't understand The Twilight Zone if you, everything begins and ends with it. If everything you know about Rod Serling as a writer begins in 1959 and ends in 1964, you ain't got it. Mm -hmm. You have to know what led into it, what, formed, what informed him, what, what issues he was involved with. And also then look what, what comes after. Um, you know, this is, this is a complete writer. And it's a 20th, I'm not sure I should get into this because I'm, you know, uh, I'm probably gonna, you know, uh, get up on a soapbox right now. Right but <laughs> it's a 20th century American conceit to want to brand something, to want to wanna identify it and be able to put a couple of words in front of it and say, that's what it is, you know. And so we we take some. We take we do this with actors. We do this with directors, and we do it with writers. So you, you, somebody says, "Well, you know, I'm I'm a writer." The media says, "Well, what do you write?" You know, well, nouns, verbs. You know, sometimes adjectives. No, 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 no. What 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 do you what do you, you know? Do you write mystery? Do you write? Are you a mystery writer? Are you a science fiction writer? And they're not happy until you can you know almost like a bug put a pin through it and then label it and say, this is what it is. And we reduce every, when you do that, you reduce it. And you reduce the thing you love the most. If the thing you love the most is the twilight zone, it's, it's almost reducing it to magic that it all, it just sprung up, you know, out of nowhere. And, and no, it's much greater than that. It's much bigger than that. And Rod Serling was much bigger than that. And you have to understand who the writer was who created this and why he created it mm -hmm. and where it came from. And that's true of every writer. I mean, you, I, I mean, this is true, but we do it constantly. You know, I, I'm, I'm writing, uh, the book I'm writing right now is a biography of Edgar Allan Poe. And, you know, we've reduced Poe, we've branded Poe. If I say Edgar Allan Poe, you're probably thinking horror writer, Edgar Allan Poe. You know, the man wrote 17 volumes of work. He only had to be 40 years old. He wrote 17 volumes of work, and this much of it is what you would call horror. It's brilliant. It's magnificent. There's a reason we're still fascinated by that. But in order to understand where that came from, you have to understand the rest of the writer. You can't just sort of pull that out and say, okay, that's it. That's him. And I think Rod Serling, also because he became the face of the Twilight Zone, kind of became this, um, this brand. And, and the brand became almost like quasi associated with this, with this almost this horror uh, image. Yeah. And, and that's not who he was. And, that, and of course, Night Gallery contributed to that, right? Sure, sure. And, and, and it's not to say that's not part of who he was. And it's not to say part of what, where, what he was drawn to. But it doesn't, if you do that and you sort of just reduce it to that, then you can't really understand it. You can't really understand the Twilight Zone and Night Gallery if you don't understand how it fits in the context of the whole writer and the whole person. So, I mean, I tend to get a little uh, passionate about this. I tend to get a little vexed about this because I think people, they love shorthand. They love, like, one of the writers who wrote for the Twilight Zone was Richard Matheson. 
and you know and I got to know Richard. Richard became a, a pretty good, and I ended up editing three volumes of Richard's work. And um, Richard hated the term horror writer Richard Matheson. Not because he wasn't proud of having written great horror. It's just that, A, he believed that Hollywood had turned horror into a uh, basically a byword for slasher. So, you know, and he thought, you know, if if horror meant Mary Shelley, and 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 Bram Stoker and Robert Louis Stevenson, then then he would have been proud to have been called a horror writer. But secondly, it was just a little bit of what he had written. R Richard had written westerns. Richard had written mysteries. Richard had written war stories. You know, and he wrote science fiction. And you know, so if you had said Richard Matheson, whose works include great horror, he'd have been fine with that. But when you reduce it to a label and made it horror writer Richard Matheson, he hated that. And he didn't want to be reduced to that, to just a definition. And I think, you know, with Rod, it was in some ways worse because he was the face of the Twilight Zone. So we not only thought we knew everything we needed to know about him as a writer, we knew everything we knew about him as a person. He was the guy in the suit with the cigarette and the clip tones talking about the Twilight Zone. And as Anne, that's why Anne's book is so, is, is so wonderful. It, it brings us the real Rod Serling, you know. He has such I, a great I, sense of humor. Yeah. All right, one more and I'm gonna shut up. No, okay. I'm <laughs> okay. If you credit Rod with having written great works of uh, works with 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 allegorical horror in it which he did <clears throat> you have to credit him with a sense of humor there has been almost nobody that i know of who has written horror who did not also have a great sense of humor it's part of the dna you can it's almost intellectually impossible to write great supernatural spooky stuff without also having a good sense of humor. And I've known and interviewed almost all of the major horror writers of the last 40 years. Stephen King, Robert Block, Richard Matheson, Ray Bradbury, Clive Barker, Anne Rice, you name it. And you know what they all have in common? Sense of humor. They all have a great sense of humor. <laughs> they are all, and it's what grounds them. Stephen King is very funny, you know? Some of them are like, Robert Block was like a stand-up comic, you know? <laughs> You know, and I once made that point to Robert Block about you know how um, uh, how horror writers are you know are 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 just very very funny and personal like comedians who you know and you know with Rich with this with comedians that comedians don't tend to be funny off off stage yeah. they tend to be very serious mm -hmm. you know because that's that's their on stage persona and then off stage they tend to be and you know and I I made that point that you know how funny and and about comedians and horror writers and 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 Block just looked at me and said yeah we're funnier too. <laughs> and you know, is you know that's how how sharp. So, if you start by saying, you know, one of the things I'm finding about you know the myths I'm going to blow up about Poe in my book is he had a tremendous sense of humor. He was a very funny guy in his life and in his writing. Yeah. The, the humor runs all through his writing. It's in the criticism and it's in the horror stories. If you look, if you take the time to look. So the, the idea that Rod Serling had a great sense of humor should be automatic. It should be, well, of course he did. How could he not have it? But that's not the way branding works. Branding reduces him to the humorless guy who is talking in, in, in the clip tones and is like, as answer, he didn't talk that way in, in, in his private life. That's not the way he, he, he and that's not the way he, he, he comported himself in, in his private life. I am never going to meet Rod Serling. You are never going to meet Rod Serling. The vast majority of the people on this planet have never, n didn't get the chance to meet him and, and will never meet him. So the closest thing you're going to get to knowing who Rod Serling was, the closest you're going to get to meeting him is in Anne's book mm -hmm. because she brings him alive in a fully three-dimensional sense and she brings to life the real person. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's one of the, the uh, to me, it's an essential. If you're if you're at all interested in the Twilight Zone, if you're all interested in in the writer who is Rod Serling, you have to read this book.
I'll plug you both at the end, but right now I'm going to recommend to all my viewers buy Mark's book and Anne's book. Both great books. Highly recommend. And it, like I said, your book I read in two sittings. Your book wasn't that much different when I was going through it. So it, uh, it's, uh, and Rod Sterling and Twilight Zone is probably my all time favorite show. So yeah, I, I was so interested in, I learned so much about, you know, your dad that I would never know. And I'm glad that you're actually sharing that for generations to come. So people can't say, what's that? Twilight Zone never heard of it. So I'm glad that, you know, Twilight Zone is going to be existing and forever and ever. Well, because you know, in part, a lot of um, schools use the scripts as teaching tools. In Binghamton, they have a program called The Fifth Dimension, where all the fifth graders watch the Twilight Zones and they learn about racism um, and mob mentality, uh, scapegoating, bullying. So it's, it's always present. And, and no one would be more surprised than my dad that he's even still being talked about. And it, 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 it tell Rich the story about uh, the students watching the Monsters Are Doing Maple Street. Oh, um, the teacher, there was an interview and the teacher aired that show. And when it was over, she asked the class, um, so who, are the, who are the monsters? And she said, all the, the entire class stood up. Do I have that right, Mark? I think. Yeah, I yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful story. Yeah, I think that's it just, is. Yeah. You know, every time I hear that story, the, the, the hairs in the back of my neck go up. Right. Uh, and, and these are fifth graders. Fifth grade. Wow. Well, yeah. that's a perfect segue. Yeah, what I want to talk the about next. The question posed was, who is, who, are the, who is the real monster? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody stood up. Yeah. Saying it was up. Well, it was a perfect segue. What I wanted to talk about because Rod certainly always wanted to be known as a writer. That was his main thing. But he was also very modest and self-deprecating, as I mentioned. And he was quoted as saying that his writing was momentarily adequate and would never stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. It's just, I would love for mm -hmm. him to see what an impact he had on oh, everybody. Oh, it's, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and, and another thing, you know, the, the themes that he dealt with that are still so relevant and prevalent. He also uh, told a writing class that he had a propensity to talk about the past and, and, I, and I think in some of his strongest writing, um, Walking Distance, uh, The Night Gallery, Tim Riley's Bar, they're, they're such beautiful scripts. And, you know, when you reach a certain age, that's so relatable, you know, to have that ability to go back. And in the case of Walking Distance, to see his parents and his hometown and see himself as a kid. And then, of course, he same thing with Willoughby. He revisits that. He, he yeah. loves talking about being able to go back. Mm -hmm. Did he prefer writing alone or collaborating? I don't know that I can answer that, but I do know that the writers on The Twilight Zone, um, it was described as a seamless team and just a lot of mutual respect. Well, he had so many great writers. You mentioned Richard Matheson, who was one of my favorite writers of all time. And he had Charles Beaumont, Earl Hamner Jr., George Clayton Johnson, Reginald Rose, Jerry Soul, and even Ray Bradbury for one episode. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that he was so confident in what he was doing that he wasn't intimidated to hire great writers. He mm -hmm. actually embraced the writers. And they made classic episodes. It wasn't like, oh, this is my show. I'm going to do more. I mean, he did write, was it 96 out of the... 92 episodes? 92 out of 92 I think 156. That's right. Yeah. But I love the fact that he had great talent. He embraced the writers and he was able to work with them. And so many great scripts were written. I mean, I can't believe it only lasted five years. It seems like there's so many different episodes that I could think of. It just seems like, and especially since it's been going on for over 60 years. Yeah. Buck Hatton's wife uh, once said that uh, it was a happy place, the, the, that writer's room. He, he was the producer. Well, the, what I love too about your, your father is that he just went for it. And tell me about in the winter of 52, your father had a life-changing talk with your mother. They went to a restaurant and he said, I need to do this. Yeah. I, I, 
I'm, I just, I've got to focus on writing. It's, um, and he wasn't sure, I guess, of the reaction that he would get. And he, he wanted to try freelancing and, and she said, go for it. Very, and very like, and like any writer, he went through his uh, 40 rejections, I believe. And, and in fact, he was told, uh, you should change your profession because you'll never be a writer. Well, that's why one of my favorite sayings is success is the best revenge. Mm -hmm. And I love that story that, oh, no, you should change your major. You'll never make it as a writer. And, and they're, they're, there's eating words now. So I love the fact that he didn't, you know, give up on that and he just kept on believing in himself and believing what he was doing. And, and what did he get? Over 400 rejections, I think it was? Uh, I, I heard 40. 40. Okay, sorry. 40. Yeah. That's, wow. Was but right, to he, he was, I think once he found writing, it, you know, there's a moment that, you know, when, when you sort of, when you find what, it's 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 almost too too uh, big a word to say you know what you're called to do or what the universe touches you and says, but there is kind of a moment with with writers that sometimes when they you know kind of realize that this is what they are are meant to do and um, I think when he found that that when he found writing, he he not only found writing he became what's called a compulsive writer. Mm -hmm. And that was somebody who's writing all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and now, and writers, you know, uh, writers tend to write even when they're not writing, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. They're kind of, like, oh, what about that chapter? How, what about that? What, that's giving me trouble. You know, you're at the dinner table and you're not really thinking about the beans on the table. You're thinking about, you yeah. know, you're, you're miles away. Yeah. And I, I think. Could, I could see that in my dad. I could, I could see when he would sort of vanish and I knew he was writing in his head. Yeah, he'd gone to the twilight zone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's, you know, that's not uncommon, but what is, un you know, there are certain writers who are literally almost writing all the time. And they were composed, Tennessee Williams was a compulsive writer. You know, Mark Twain was a compulsive writer. Um, they were just constantly, and, and Rob Serling was, a, when he found it, I think he, what he understood, that he had found what he was meant to do because he did become a compulsive writer. He became somebody he's, you know, you just look at the output, um, you know, for the, he, he only, he only lives to be 50 years old, but you look at what he did with those 50 years. He, he used whatever he used those years. Yeah. And I'm he 50. So I feel like a slacker. <laughs> yeah. Rod Charlie. Well, and then you add to the fact, like when you were sitting on the twilight zone that he was, the the showrunner, he was the executive producer. He was the head writer. He was the narrator. He was the chief writer. Um, I I don't know how he even survived those five years, quite frankly. You know, because he he was he, he took on a tremendous amount of work, and he was very, as you said, he was very hard on himself. Mm -hmm. You know, he he would have said, you know, how many people who would have done the Twilight Zone, and it would have been the accomplishment of a lifetime, which it was. And yet he looked at the Twilight Zone and would say, well, you know, a third of the scripts were, were, were pretty good. A third of them were mediocre and the third was garbage. Like, you know, no. it's, it's, I think that that's just a, you know, I, I, you know, I know Anne's been asked this question a lot about, you know, what would have been the next step for your dad? What, what would he would have done next? The thing about that is it, it, it absolutely takes for, for granted there would have been a next step. And I think that that's true. I yeah. think, it, you know, a compulsive writer doesn't stop. Yeah. They've always sort of got their eye on the next thing. They've always got their eye on, and I think he did. He and did I think he would have. And he I think he would have gone on to something else. He wanted to write a novel and a Broadway show. But I just wanted to circle back to, because I'm thinking about this as you're talking uh, why my dad became a writer. And one of the thing, one of the hardest parts about writing my book was reading the letters that to and from his parents when my father was in training camp. And at, he was 18 and my son was 18 at that time when I was writing some of those chapters. So it really punctuated how young these kids are that go off to war and their lives are just altered so drastically. 
Um, and when my dad was overseas, his father died at 52. And my father was, even though the war was over and he had enough points to go home, they wouldn't let him go home. And for years he was furious with the Red Cross because they had made that decision. But I think, you know, my, and from everything I heard, my dad had a very idyllic childhood. And, and I think he said the war put an end to all of that. So writing again was cathartic and how he found um, acceptance, I guess, or, or a way to navigate the loss of his own dad, the loss of everything he knew as a kid, so. Did he have a writing schedule or did he just write when inspired? It sounds like he was inspired get, a lot. He'd get up very early in the morning. He'd have a cup of uh, black coffee with sugar. And uh, originally he had an office within the house and then he built a study in the backyard. Um, and he'd go out there very early and he'd work and then he'd drive to the studio. But you know, I know in that, again, that Mike Wallace interview, he talked about working 12 hours a day or something, but I never felt that my father wasn't accessible. Um, I wasn't exaggerating that in the, in the book. I, I remember coming home from school and we'd play basketball together all the time. And we'd go on trips together, um, you know, when I was older. He always had time for the family, which is yeah. very important. Yeah, there was always dinner, you know, together and vacations away together and yeah. I want to talk about what Mark said about all the hours that he worked on the Twilight Zone. And either you or Anne could tell me how that had an effect on Ray Bradbury. Well, Ray told me that um, is because I, um, in the book, I scatter uh, lessons, life lessons that which, uh, about the Twilight Zone from, uh, from people who were involved with the Twilight Zone, who were, you know, who were fans of the Twilight Zone. And some of them were, were utter surprises. Like one was Mel Brooks, you know, is that yeah. I had no idea that Mel Brooks was not only idolized your dad, and but also that he, the Twilight Zone was his favorite show. And he could, he'll talk for, for forever. I mean, it's about the Twilight Zone. If you just said, Mel, talk Twilight Zone, he would be talking for two hours. Yeah. And I mean, it was just, I, I was interviewing him about something totally, I think, about an HBO special I think he was doing. And somehow we got on the Twilight Zone and I told him I was writing a book about it and uh, he, that's all I had to say. And I said, well, you know, you, you would, do you, you have a favorite lesson? And he just, I mean, it, I, I, he didn't even stop to think. He just started talking and it's word for word what I put in the book. Mm -hmm. Word for word, it came out absolutely perfectly. And uh, Ray Bradbury, um, had died when I was writing, or had already died when I was doing the book. But I had interviewed Ray. I was going to do a book with Ray at one point in the 1980s. We were going to do a book called Kaleidoscope, which was going to look at his works being transferred to other medium, uh, into radio, movies, TV. And uh, basically, we were going to take the conceit from the, the Hitchcock Truffaut book, where I would interview him, and we would just put the interviews around the various adaptations. And we had, we'd done a lot. We, we, we went, had gone very, very deep on Something Wicked This Way Comes and the Martian Chronicles and some other things. But uh, then I got wrapped up in doing the Columbo book and he got wrapped up and it was one of those things where we went in different directions. But I had hours and hours of taped interviews with him. So when I was doing the book, I was thinking, I wonder if there is a life lesson in all of that that I could extract. And sure enough, when he started doing the Ray Bradbury Theater, which started on HBO and then jumped to the USA Network, which was an anthology show of his own stories, um, he said that when uh, USA came to him to do it as a, as a series, they said to him, okay, um, well, we're going to do like 18 episodes a, a season. And he said, no, we're not. We're going to do 12. And they said, no, we're going to do 18. And he, he said, no, we're going to do 12. And he said, no, we're, we're going to, it's 18 or there's no series. And Ray said, well, it's sure been nice knowing you. And uh, I hope you do well with the series. And they came back and said, okay, 12. But then they asked him why 12. And he said, 
because if I just do 12, it'll be playing. If I do 18, it'll be work. And he said, and the reason for that is I used to go by the Twilight Zone offices and I saw how hard Rod Serling worked and how hard he was, how every second of his time was taken. It was a pressure cooker. And he said, and I said, I'm never going to do that. That was the lesson he learned from the Twilight Zone was not to work, you know, to, to, to work that hard and put yourself through that. Um, and I think even Rod probably kind of learned that lesson in a way, but it had a detrimental effect because when it came time to do Night Gallery, he basically said, as long as I'm not the producer, he didn't want to go through it again. <clears throat> and that, of course, created, because he assumed he would be the head writer and they would defer to him on Night Gallery. And Jack Laird did not defer to him on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, it's not that Jack Laird didn't have a lot of talent and he wasn't a, a good producer and didn't write good stuff for Night Gallery. But I'll say this, almost the, all of the greatest moments on Night Gallery were because of Rod Serling and all of the dumbest moments mm -hmm. on Night Gallery were because of Jack Laird. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. and I, and Night I, I, remember, oh, go ahead, I was just gonna say, I remember my dad saying Jack Laird's name through gritted teeth. It was huh. very difficult, you know, because yeah. Unlike the Twilight Zone, he didn't have creative control, and it was extremely frustrating for him. It, it had to be, and 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 there he was. For once, he actually was talking through gritted teeth. What well, mm -hmm. uh, this was <laughs> because of Jack Lair. Yeah. And, and yet, though that episode I mentioned before, they're towing down Tim Riley's bar. What a beautiful script that is! Oh, and and uh, you know, there are several night galleries, and not just ones that your dad wrote. There are a lot of night galleries which show what that show could have been if, you know, it had been done, at, 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 if night gallery had always been done where it was at its best, it would have been, a, it would have been an outstanding show. I'm not sure it would have still been another talk, but it would have been, uh, uh, it, it, it would have been a, a, a much better show than it was, you know. The best of night gallery is outstanding, is, 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 is wonderful. There's and one episode I want to talk about, and either one of you can answer this one. It was directed by Steven Spielberg, originally supposed to star Betty Davis. She took one look at him and said, there's no way I'm going to work for a director this young. Joan Crawford stepped in and won an Emmy. I think it was called Eyes. It was called Eyes, right. Yeah, that's, um, that, that's in the pilot. That, that, was not, yeah. that actually wasn't, before it was a series, they, Night Gallery was done as a standalone TV movie. Oh, okay. With, with with three episodes, and uh, it was actually Rod had, had written a, a book called the Se A Season to Be Wary, and it had three stories, and two of the stories ended up in that uh, as Night Gallery, and then he wrote a, an original story as the third, and that was uh, so successful that they then decided to to do it as a series, uh, and Eyes was one of the three, mm -hmm. and it was one of the first things that I. I think it was the first thing Spielberg directed. Yes, it was. At, at Universal, you know, because he then, he, he directs the first Columbo uh, episode, of Murder by the Book with Jack Cassidy. Um, and he directs an episode of The Psychiatrist. And he, so he's, he's doing series work uh, at, at Universal during this period. But I think Eyes was the first. Yeah. Your father ever talk about that? Did he have to deal with Joan Crawford and Betty Davis during that time? Well, I... His, the office phone would also ring in the in the house, and apparently she was calling him frequently. She was um, a perfectionist, and now we know so much more, right? Um, but yeah, it, I, it was getting to him. <laughs> but you know, she delivered a great performance, right? Yeah. When was the first time you realized that your dad was on TV? Um, well and I wrote this in the book. I, I knew from an early age that my father was a writer, but I didn't really have a clue what he was writing. We weren't allowed to watch TV during the week. Uh, this was my mom's rule, but my dad and I would sneak in episodes of the Flintstones. But anyway, um, a boy on the playground when I was probably seven or so asked me if I was something out of the Twilight Zone. And I had no idea what that meant. So I went home and I asked my father and he explained that he wrote for a show and it was a little too old for me. And, um, but that 
that was the, I think, the first recognition. And then the first episode I saw, even though my dad didn't write this one, was Monsters Are Doing, or um, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. That Richard just Madison. Me. Yeah, that's a great, well, they're all great episodes. I can't think of one that's, you know, they're all, one's always better than the other. They're, I can't think of one episode that's even kind of weak because there's so many great writers and so many great stories and the acting's unbelievable too. And I want to talk about that too because all the actors that got their start in the Twilight Zone, I have a short list, William Shatner, of course, then you have Peter Falk, Burgess Meredith, Cloris Leachman, Robert Redford, Roddy McDowell, Jack Klugman, Elizabeth Montgomery, Kevin McCarthy, Lee Marvin, and Carol Burnett. And that's just a short list of all the people that appeared on the Twilight Zone and were just up and coming at that time. And speaking of Carol Burnett, you have a great story of your father, Carol Burnett, and a sandwich. Right. There, there was a letter. Um, she was in the episode, um, is it Cavender is Coming? Yes, that's right. Right. And uh, my dad was quite disappointed with it. He written her a letter that he was so sorry um, and and she had written back I wish I had the letter to refresh my memory oh it wasn't so bad and he said I'll buy you a corned beef sandwich next time I'm in town and she said well I don't like corned beef or something but I, she was and is one of the loveliest people just just not not who you'd imagine, you know, with, with all that stardom, because she's just so special and warm and lovely and funny and um, just a nice, nice woman. You got a chance to meet her. Well, actually, I for my birthday, I wanted to go to the taping of her show. And my dad took my friend and me, and it was, and someone must have told her he was in the audience because she identified him and, yeah. Right. And there's another story that's in the book I want you to talk about. Tell my viewers. It had uh, it involved Willie, the dummy from the episode entitled The Dummy, right. starring Cliff Robertson. Tell my viewers about that. Yeah, my dad brought the dummy home. And uh, of course, my sister and I had not a clue what this was. It was just so thrilling to have it sitting at our dinner table. And I think Jody and I were fighting over who could sleep with it. and you know, in the days before my dad had to take it back to the studio. And so then seeing that episode years later it was kind of uh, stunning. You had no idea at the time. No idea whatsoever. It was just so fun. And my dad would make it talk. And <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. And w what age did you actually become a fan of The Twilight Zone? Because I know Nightmare 20,000 Feet really did s profoundly scare you when you saw it. And it wasn't kind of your kind of TV show when you were that age. I, I actually didn't watch a lot of them when my father was alive. It was after he died, um, I really started to, to watch them. And, and it was more to see him than, than the episode. And one, that, one of the first ones I watched after he died was in Praise of Pip. And mm -hmm. was just stunned to find that he used the... Uh, same dialogue that that or this uh, that he and I would have. Who's your best buddy? You are pop, and I mean this was something he and I would say to each other all the time. And then to watch this episode and hear it, it was um, literally finding my dad in the twilight zone again. I guess I could say. Is that your favorite episode? It's one of the. It's one of them. I I think it's a um, very touching, touching episode. And Bill Mummy is so good too, and Jack Klugman is fabulous in everything he did too. Right? Um, yeah, I like uh, and Death's Head, and and what I was trying to remember about the ending of Death's Head when my dad talks is, um, you most of the uh, shows would end with him saying a lesson to be learned in the Twilight Zone. But Death's Head was one of the few where he said uh, a lesson to be learned not only in the Twilight Zone, but wherever man walks the earth. Um, so really emphasizing that. But uh, back to your question, uh, walking distance, Willoughby. I have a propensity to deal with the past, too. So uh, I really love those episodes. What about you, Mark? Well, I, I, I always like to say when somebody asks me uh, about what my favorite episode is, I say that the, the answer changes depending on the day you ask me. 
Um, and I and I think that is true. But there are certain episodes which are um, always on the list. You know, uh, the obsolete man is 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 very very close. If I had to pick a favorite, I think the character of Romney Wordsworth that uh, Burgess Meredith plays is one of the most heroic uh, characters uh, in the history of the Twilight Zone. I think the messages are all spot on, timeless. Um, I just, I, I, I love that episode. Monsters are doing Maple Street is, is, uh, is always going to be in my top. And unfortunately, it's always relevant. Yeah. You know, that there's no question that Rod Serling was writing about the McCarthy era and that, 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 that awful era when suspicion and fear could turn neighbor against neighbor. But that episode has not only grown in resonance, it has grown in relevance uh, to the point where we are today. And the messages of that are, have to be heard, you know, because, you know, Rod is basically telling us that if, if we do not find a way, we do not find a way to, 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 to talk to each other, to communicate with each other, we ain't going to make it. We are simply not going to make it. And that is, you know, the, if you let people prey on the divisions and, 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 and the fears and the prejudices, that will drive us apart. And I think that, you know, um, the entire country needs to be sit down and shown that episode at the same time. Yeah, I, they, agree. They, they, I think they, they, everybody needs to see it and, and needs to be, you know, put, but given a lesson. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's, and, and, and there's a chance because that's something that Rod understood when he did the Twilight Zone is that people will listen if you present it in the right way. You know, Mark Twain once said that humor must not professedly preach and it must not professedly teach but it must do both if it will live mm -hmm. and i think rod understood that about fantasy storytelling was that you can't be there waving your finger in somebody's face you've got to lure them in you have got to entertain them you've got to engage them you've got to hold their interest but it's still the moral has got to be there the the the, the, the preaching has got to be there and they'll take it with humor. Humor and, 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 and allegorical uh, fantasy storytelling are two of the greatest forms for making people see themselves, making people see, you know, what to, and they, they you know, I, I remember what was, you know, that Hal Holbrook is a friend, uh, Mark Twain, can't you, can you tell? And, uh, you know, I remember once, because I've played Twain, on stage for for about 40 years and you know i wouldn't even step on stage without hal's blessing and permission but for many years we would compare notes about audiences response to things and i do a segment when i do when i was twain were on politics it's about a 15 minute monologue and um it's drawn from bits and pieces it's all 100 percent twain but it's drawn from different things that he wrote and it starts off funny. It starts off talking about Congress. It starts off talking about that grand old benevolent national asylum for the helpless Congress. And it starts with laugh lines and things like that. But then it gets, it gets progressively more serious because it's taking the blame off the politicians and putting it where it belongs on the citizens who are not involved and let politicians get away with what they do. And all of a sudden, I'm talking not talking about them, I'm talking about them, right, directly. And they get quiet. They get really, and the silence is almost more powerful than the laughter at that point. And I, I, I shared that with Hal once, and Hal said, the word you're looking for is chastened. They are chastened by what you're saying. And they'll take it from Mark Twain when they won't take it from anybody else. If you or I went out on that stage and said the exact same things, they wouldn't take it from us. And that's true of Rod Serling too. They'll take it from Rod Serling when they won't take it from anybody else. I know conservatives who love the Twilight Zone. Interesting. I know, you know, hard, who, who know because the verites are, 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 are there and they recognize them as true. And this is, this is, the, this is the chance. This is what these writers can do they can talk to everybody and they can make them listen. They can compel them to listen and cut through all of the nonsense and say, you got, you know, 
this is the warning bell. Mm -hmm. Listen to the warning right now. Because if you don't, it is all going to fall on your children and your children's children. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, you know, it's one of the reasons we're, here, we're, we're talking about the Twilight. We're talking about a series, a black and white series from 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the great power of the storytelling. And there's a reason for that. I mean, you, you, this didn't happen just because, ooh, it's the Twilight Zone and we all love the Twilight Zone. It's because the storytelling, the writing is eternal. And to do that, you have to pull off a really elusive trick. What your writing has to be eternal. Well, that's true of a lot of writers. It's true of Shakespeare. You know, it's true of uh, Dickens. It's true of uh, Mark Twain. It's true of, of, of Rod Serling. But the other thing you have to do to really be making a connection all those years later is you have to talk in a voice which sounds relevant. Now, wait a minute. Do you know many people who read Dickens? I can think of no, 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 people know people know the stories and they'll say oh right. christmas carol but right. I, have you ever read it i saw the movie i get a lot but, of that they, they'll say well i tried but i i, I just can't yeah, get yeah. into it or i can't do this is you know a lot of writers are, are talking to us in a language which seems like an ancient language you know uh and you have to stick with it i mean if you stick with dickens enough the, the light bulb will finally go off and you go oh it's english you know people do that with shakespeare too i was gonna say that yeah the one thing about Mark Twain and Rod Serling, that, that one of the things that they have, many things they have in common, is they both speak to us in a language which seems as clear and as concise today as when it was written. How many times have somebody said, when they, you, you, you share a Mark Twain quote with them, it sounds like he's talking about today. Well, not only because of what he's saying recognizes that human nature doesn't change, but also because he's saying it in a way that we, we, we readily understand and we readily recognize. And the Twilight Zone and Rod does the exact same thing. For all that black and white, for all of those old customs and old cars, it seems so relevant to today. It seems like he's speaking in a language which we understand. Mm -hmm. and, I agree with that. and he never yeah. talks down to you either. I love yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's tough to pull off. That's a double play that is really, really tough to pull off. But it speaks to the question of why are we still talking about the Twilight Zone? You know, that's why I find it so fascinating that what he said about his writing that would never stand the test of time. And it said it's moderately adequate. It's, I mean, I don't think he, he obviously didn't realize the impact he was having or would have on people years and years later. Well, you said, you said it, Rich, if only he could come back and see. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I have to leave shortly. I'm just giving you a warning. Um, okay. Have to yes. fix. Hey, um, Anne? Yes. Anna, I found it. Um, this was the end of, of Death's Head Revisited. Okay. All the duck cows must remain standing. The duck cows, the Belsons, the Buchenwalds, the Auschwitz, it's all of them. They must remain standing because they are a monument to a moment in time when some men decided to turn the earth into a graveyard. Into it, they shoveled all of their reason, their logic, their knowledge, but worst of all, their conscience. And the moment we forget this, the moment we cease to be haunted by its remembrance, then we become the grave diggers. Something to dwell on and remember, not only in the twilight zone, but wherever men walk God's earth. That's it, yeah. You know, yeah. and that's about, uh, and that's a message which again, is, is it's, it's never, it's never it's not going to lose its resonance mm -hmm. it's, it's never going to lose one little bit of its resonance i think what's great too is that it was a series but each episode was like a mini movie so mm -hmm. it's not a recurring recurring characters that you had to watch last season and know what's happening this season every episode was for the most part completely different but it had so many you know the same morals the same morality but the mm -hmm. stories were different and Anne, i know you have to go so Mark, if you don't mind, I just want to talk about your book after Anne leaves. I have a couple more questions about your book. But Anne, before you do leave, what's next and where can people find you? Um, my dog is crying. I'm sorry. I, I, am on, I am on Twitter. I am on Facebook. Um, 
Uh, I'm working on a new edition of my memoir, and I'm writing a novel. All right. Well, I look forward to that. And thank you very, very much for being on the show. You're great. And keep up the great work of spreading the word about the work that your father has done. And so I think it's very important that people know about the Twilight Zone. Well, thank you and so much. It's wonderful to meet you. And as always, great to see you, Mark. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk soon. We'll talk soon. Have a good night, everybody. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Thanks, Anne. Night, Anne. Night, night.